of the mechanisms, it's not the only mechanism, but one of the mechanisms, and it turns out to be a very important mechanism of neuropathic pain is this thing called central sensitization. Central sensitization. There's several ways of generating neuropathic pain. One way is via central sensitization that in the last number of years has been determined to be a driver of many, many different neuropathic pains. And so here's a very short list of clinical syndromes that in many cases have now been found to have elements of central sensitization. For some reason, some central nervous system neuron is now becoming sensitized and more easily activated by something other than, and, I, and we'll have to kind of follow me when I get to it, but it's later on this, this uh, continuing pain can now be generated by non-painful, non-nociceptive activation. So arthritis, fibromyalgia, headache, uh, chronic, chronic pain, creatitis, and this is just an incredibly short list that now it's our central sensitization is part of the driver of the neuropathic pain seen in this. So, how does neuropathic pain develop? It always starts with activation of a nociceptive pathway. So, peripheral pain receptor or peripheral pain neurons are considered high threshold receptors. But uh, look at all these dendrites and cell bones. Yeah. Very common with central sensitization. Somebody has some type of trauma or some type of uh, lesion at an area that initi initially causes neuro uh, nociceptive pain. Nociceptive pain. So this pathway is turned on. This pathway is turned on. This pathway is turned on. And you know the longer that one of these neural pathways is turned on, you actually start having an increase in synaptic terminals, an increase in dendrites, and that actually makes it easier to send the message through that system. So no susceptive pain, usually, some type of damage leading to no susceptive pain, usually sets things up for this central sensitization. Once you have this elaboration right here, more likely to have a problem with it. Pain neurons are considered very high threshold. It takes a lot to activate them. You know that they don't adapt, but it takes quite a bit of quite a bit of input to actually activate a pain neuron. But uh, we're going to look at something called hyperalgesia and allodynia. Both of them, well, one of them is probably more likely caused by central sensitization. So hyperalgesia is when you have an excessive pain response from what's normally a painful stimulus. So if you were to stick a needle in the back of my hand, like I always say, you know, it's going to hurt, but it's not going to ruin my day. But if I'm suffering hyperalgesia, stick it in the back of my hand. Oh my goodness, it hurts terrible. Oh, can I make it through the day? Well, maybe this is going on. So now what's normal, a normal painful stimulus is now perceived as abnormally severe. So hyperalgesia is a term you're going to run across, you're going to hear about. It's typical pain responses that are magnified. And allodynia, this is something different. Allodynia is something different. Allodynia is when non-painful stimuli actually activate pain sensations, pain perception. So let's say we have some type of tactile receptor. This would be an A beta mechanoreceptive neuron. Let's say this is a tactile receptor on the surface of your skin. These things are incredibly low threshold. You know, it doesn't take too much stimulation. 
to feel the movement against the back of my skin, right? It takes quite a bit of stimulation to actually generate pain. Much higher threshold, much lower threshold. But if you happen to have this type of elaboration, all these dendrites, because this pathway had previously been turned on for a long period of time, and maybe that lesion, it's healed. The trauma, it's, it's healed. So this pathway down here, it's no longer on. It's no longer on because whatever the trigger was, it's healed. But we have so much afferent convergence, so much of these afferent neurons coming into a small area. And yet I didn't draw it in, but this mechanoreceptive tactile receptor and its neuron, it would have its own neuron that it would activate, that would send transmissions, in this case probably up the dorsal column, going to the somatosensory cortex. And yeah, I can feel movement against the back of my skin. But these things are in such close proximity. If you get a tremendous elaboration, developing more dendrites in this area, guess what? So, let's say you have a little tactile sensation, you know, movement of a feather against your skin. That's you know, normally no big deal. This activates some of this neurotransmitter can actually seep over into this pain transmitting pathway. And what's it going to do? It's going to go to the pain sensing area of the brain because that's where that pathway goes. So this tactile sensation, which is normally not painful at all, because of this buildup of dendrites, you can get this inappropriate activation of a pain pathway. That's an example of allodynia. So this is central sensitization, central sensitization, and it is one of the mechanisms for allodynia. You see the very same thing with if you have a peripheral thermoreceptor, <coughs> they're very low threshold. So I'm not talking about something really hot, I'm just talking about a little bit of warmth or maybe even something that's a little bit cool. Something that normally wouldn't cause pain. Unfortunately, some of this neurotransmitter is going to seep over into this now larger than typical receptive field and therefore activate that pain response. So, in this case, whether it's coming from this tactile stimulation or this thermal stimulation, it is not coming from nociceptors. So this is non-nociceptive pain. Do you see this non, allodynia is non-nociceptive pain. And it is um, activating those pain pathways. So hyperalgesia is typically, typically thought of as nociceptive pain in one of these sensitized pathways where you have this increase in synaptic terminals and this increase in dendrites. So hyperalgesia is normal painful stimulation being perceived as excessive pain. So that's normally considered nociceptive pain. You activate this nociceptor, you have increased pain perception. But allodynia, allodynia is something that's normally non-painful but now it's generating a pain response. It turns out the central sensitization is a mechanism for both. This increased synaptic terminals, this increased dendrites. You sensitize this, the synapse here in the central nervous system. So that, does that kind of fit and make some sense? Yeah, I'll, so this does that hyperalgesia, is that just generally the central sensitization? Yes. Is that what it is? Like it's just it's because of the growth of the synapses? Yes, because of the growth of those synapses, you have a greater chance, a greater chance that instead of having one action potential in a unit time, you might generate five. Because more synapse, uh, more neurotransmitter coming in here, more depolarization, it might be depolarized a little bit longer, and therefore you can send a 
greater number of action potentials. More action potentials, more perception. Yeah. Thank you. So th this is a this is a real problem. This is a real problem, and it all started. It all started with some initial pain response that unfortunately had been that was going on for a long time, and you had a nociceptive pain response going on a long time, leading to this development right here. And leading to this development right here sets you up potentially for hyperalgesia and allodynia. Now, not all long-standing pain leads to hyperalgesia and allodynia. Some pathways appear to be more susceptible to it, but this is the simplest picture that I've figured out from some complicated uh, papers. The simplest way to explain this that I know, and I now presented it to a number of healthcare groups, and they go, oh yeah, that, that kind of digests this into something pretty easily understood. So clinicians think, oh, okay, yeah, that's not bad. That's a good way to explain it. So any questions on that? Now, some points to consider here is, well, some of these points really go to something else, but uh, chronic pain is, is a problem in this country. A huge number of people in this country suffer from some type of chronic pain, and central sensitization plays a role in many of the cases. Chronic pain does not always result in central sensitization, but in many cases it does. It turns out genetics appear to play possibly a fairly important role, maybe a 25 to 30, this is, this is what's thought right now, a 25 to, it's either 35 or 40 percent contribution to if somebody is susceptible to central sensitization. So there might be a genetic component. Environmental is more important, but genetics may play a role. Now, all of these things go to together. When some becomes, has central sensitization, and you have this elaboration of pain responses, that leads to sleep deprivation, that increases anxiety, that increases depression, and all these things are mutually reinforcing. Anxiety and depression exacerbates, in a different way, your reaction to pain. It probably doesn't change the actual pain, but your reaction to pain does change. That turns out to be a complicated, higher cognitive process. So when these things start, it can lead to more anxiety, more depression, more loss of sleep, worse uh, outcomes, or I should say uh, a worsening feeling, a worsening response to pain. And unfortunately, you're gonna have patients like this. Now, Central sensitization was initially started with what? It was initially started with normal activation of the normal pain pathway. That's what started everything. This normal pain pathway was activated and it probably stayed turned on for a period of time leading to this long-term potentiation, possibly neural facilitation over here. So, there's a lot of research right now with, okay, since peripheral nociceptive activation initiates this, how do we stop this from happening to begin with? So there's so many different strategies being worked on, but they all have kind of a an underlying problem with them. So a lot of work working on preventive strategies to prevent central sensitization uh, that, are, that are being studied. But here's the central problem is, yes, when you activate a pain pathway and it's turned on a long period of time, uh, you will start releasing neural modulators that cause this increase growth of synaptic terminals, increased growth of dendrites. That's normal. Where else do you also see that? Learning. 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 And probably many other things. But 
with learning, the more times you activate that pathway to recall that information, you will also get that increase in synaptic terminals, increase in dendrites. So the big concern is that the therapies that are being developed to preventively, preemptively prevent central sensitization from occurring may also hinder learning. And it makes sense. It makes sense that that would be a concern. Uh, now, luckily, 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 central sensitization appears to be reversible. If you can get that person out of pain for a sufficient period of time, you'll start, if it's one of those things, if you don't use it, you lose it. The synaptic terminal, that it, it takes a lot of energy to maintain all those synaptic terminals and dendrites. And neurons are smart, like a lot of other cells in the body. If you're not gonna use it, let's reduce down to just what we actually need. So that those physical changes appear to be reversible leading to a reversing of central sensitization. So if you can keep those pathways turned off for a, a period of time, that seems to reverse the central sensitization and patients don't suffer that. So best strategies of doing that are uh, being studied, but unfortunately, pain happens to have a lot of heterogeneity. There's a lot of differences from patient to patient from person to person. So when you have situations like that, it's usually not one size fits all, one the therapy works for everything. Yeah. Um, how do patients or providers tell the difference between nociceptive pain and neuropathic pain? Well, you're gonna learn that from your clinicians, but uh, there is there's what's called inappropriate pain responses. You know, you can poke people and see what the appropriate pain response, but if that person talks about triggers, triggers that are not considered to be painful responses, that immediately makes people start wondering, is it neuropathic? So you ask questions about triggers, and then there are specific tests that are done to see if you can elicit pain with something, you know, when the person's not looking, you know, you do certain maneuvers and you go, well, this should cause pain. And if it does, it's like, okay, we've got another problem. Right. So there is kind of a, everything starts with history and physical yeah. to find out about triggers. And then I know neurologist and also anesthesiologists play a role in this. They have their checklist of how yeah. to determine that. Because I guess I was thinking like, you know, some people or a lot of people uh, have like chronic back pain and I've like read a couple articles about how like just simply the way you think about your back pain can affect how it... Oh, I, I, absolutely. That's what so gets like, to, um, that's what gets to this. Right. And so, yeah, like people like, if you like expect your back to hurt or something, then like it will hurt. It, yes. That's process. called pain syndrome. That's called pain syndrome. So does if that you, have to do with this at all? Like, well, or is that different? That, that's actually something different. That's how you're, you cognitively react to the situation. And it's not just pain, it's anxiety and depression and things like that. So different people will react differently to those types of things. But there is something called pain syndrome that if people feel that they should be in pain, there's ways you can measure they're actually in pain. Right. So. Again, and back pain is one of those where those studies have been done. So what you've read is, yeah, that's that's the concern that there's a lot of, and, and this is where it's so difficult. NIH every two years has a National Institute of Health has these big pain consortium meetings and you can look at somebody and not find a physical cause and by every measure, that person's suffering. That's tough. That's tough. And therefore, the therapies that you use probably aren't physical or, uh, you know, physical therapies like going to a PT or ice ski. Yeah. Transcutaneous electroneural stimulation. It might be something else. 
that's why being so homogeneous, it's such a difficult thing to deal with. What do you do? Yeah, I was wondering, so if you shut off the pathways for a while and it starts to revert back to where it was, does it revert all the way back to normal? Or does it It, it certainly appears, some, it, it, some papers show complete reversion. So then if learning is in the same kind of sense, if we don't re keep going over the information, eventually we're going to start losing it, but then you how are, come it's easier to re like regain it then? Well, okay, this gets to, there are some things that are encoded in your long-term memory that it's wired in there, and but the ability to quickly recall it, those pathways are plastic. So I bet there are things in your life that you learned and knew very, very well at one time, but you're kind of rusty about them right now. It would take you a fraction of the time to get back to that point than what it took you to begin with. You know, you start studying that again and go, okay, now I've got it. Whereas it might have taken you weeks to get it to begin with. No, you're going, I, I'm convinced I don't know it. And then you practice with it a little bit, practice, and all of a sudden you've got it. And all of us have had that experience. It's the pathways to get from one area to another. But when things are encoded in long-term memory, they tend to be, they're not incorruptible, but they become close to incorruptible. Uh, and that takes eight to 10 years. It's now, that's the latest uh, estimate of that, to make incorruptible pathways. Yeah. Okay, so just out of curiosity, can genetics alone cause neural translation without the presence of temporal translation? I've never seen anything like that. I've never seen anything like that. I certainly want this coming. Because I'll, I'll show you a slide coming up here about the genetics of some sodium channels that, wow, completely change pain perception. And uh, so genetics, you know, when you talk about a population and you go, there's 25% genetic contribution in the population, you never know. There might be one person or two people that is 100%. 100%. Okay, so. Uh, this is just nothing for you. This is for a completely different course, but this is, you know, here we have a peripheral nociceptive neuron that releasing substance P. This thing also releases a whole lot of other neuromodulators that will, that can sensitize these pathways. And, and the thing that's very interesting is these, uh, this neuron will release growth factors over to here that will cause an increase in dendrites, and this over here can release growth factors that will stimulate <coughs> the production of synaptic terminals. So there's this bi-directional control of the system. So there's so many different players in this, and there's so many different drugs that are used to modulate this. And some are experimental, a lot of these are actually being used, but it's a complicated system. It's a very complicated system. You're going to be astonished when you get to the pharmacology of pain management, all the different ways to try to manage this process. Referred pain, I want to talk a little bit about referred pain. Jessica, what well, you mentioned, I, I'll actually have a slide after we get past the diagnosis pain. So referred pain, almost all of us know what that is. It's when you sense pain in an area but it turns out that area is not what's causing the activation of pain. Now, have we talked about referred pain at all? We haven't said a word about it yet, have, have we? The other name for it is heterotopic pain. So here is, did I give you this? I hope I gave you this. Visceral and deep somatic pain is often perceived as cutaneous or more superficial pain but it usually doesn't work the other direction. It usually doesn't work the other direction. And so the way that almost everybody describes referred pain is by the example that most of us have heard. Somebody who is suffering some myocardial ischemia, they have insufficient blood flow to the heart for the heart to perform the work 
that it has demands placed on it. And if you have myocardial ischemia, so insufficient blood flow, that means you're probably going to have insufficient oxygen delivery, insufficient CO2 removal. And at some point, you'll also have insufficient nutrients going to the heart. And if one suffers myocardial ischemia, yes, there is sensation of that, and that's pressure on the chest. But very commonly, what do you hear? Somebody suffering myocardial ischemia, maybe their jaw, their left shoulder, or their left arm. That's quite common in males. In females, it may more be more abdominal. Why that is, I don't know. I don't know. But if the but women can suffer left side pain or left jaw too. But women sometimes present with more central pain during myocardial ischemia. So somebody suffering myocardial ischemia, let's say we've got your typical 60-year-old guy and his shoulder hurts or his left arm hurts or maybe his jaw hurts. Why is that? Now there are many, many, many different mechanisms of referred pain, but they all have one thing in common. I'll get to that. So here is actually the sensory pathway for that area of the shoulder. Here's the labeled line. It goes up to the area of the thalamus. That, when you activate it, it's, I feel shoulder sensation. So if you do some type of, you punch this guy in the shoulder or something like that, it's going to activate this pathway and shoulder hurts. Shoulder hurts. But if somebody has myocardial ischemia, and I didn't draw it in, but there's actually another labeled line for the heart, it goes up here to the thalamus, and when you have myocardial ischemia, the true uh, sensation of that is pressure on the chest. What do people talk about? It was like an elephant was sitting on the chest. But sometimes when you have myocardial ischemia and you activate this afferent sensory neuron, it's going to come in via the dorsal nerve root, like all of them afferent sensory pathways do, it can be releasing so much neurotransmitter, and yet it's probably activating its labeled line, and I guess I grabbed the slides that didn't have it. Some of its neurotransmitter can seep over and activate the shoulder line, because these come in together at such a, a close proximity. So what happens is inadvertently, and this is the case with referred pains all throughout the body, so neurotransmitter can inadvertently activate another pathway's labeled line. So it goes to that pathway specific area in the thalamus or somatosensory cortex, and you feel that sensation. You feel that sensation. So all of a sudden, and there's so many different proposed mechanisms, convergent projection, convergent facilitation, thalamic convergence, axonal reflex, there's many different mechanisms that are thought. It appears that none of them completely explain all referred pain. What do they all have in common? Aferent neurons converging together in a small space. And therefore, some messages can get, have some crossover. Just thinking of it that way, that is usually good enough to help you. Now, understand this. So this person might suffer some shoulder pain, might suffer left arm pain, might suffer a specific toothache, one, two, three. And then, and referred pain can really be a difficult thing to work out. And here's from your book, and actually this edition of the book has a slightly different version of this, but for example, uh, lung and diaphragm problems, often refer to and being felt as sensations in the neck. A friend of mine years ago, she had to see if one of her fallopian tubes was patent, so they injected nitrogen gas in the fallopian tube. And that gas floats up and gets underneath the diaphragm. It's pressing and irritating underneath the diaphragm. Just like they told her, tonight you might feel neck sensations. Sure enough, she did. Sure enough, she did. Um, you don't need to obviously need to memorize these things, but uh, for example, liver and gallbladder, sometimes you feel it here, sometimes you feel it all the way up here. And on and on and on. And you know, uh, 
for example, somebody I know, this kid was sledding and had a big crash sledding and it's like, oh, and it's my neck hurts. And I thought, oh, boy, this could be serious, it could be a neck injury. Well, it turned out it wasn't a neck injury, it lacerated his spleen. And, you know, you can bleed out pretty quickly from a lacerated spleen. So something down here, and the kid's neck was hurting very, very bad. So they were concerned. Very quickly got the kid to the emergency room. Turned out no neck problems, but the kid was bleeding out internally. So, boy, with referred pain, you really, really, really have to have your antenna up and paying attention. Referred pains in the oral cavity are just unbelievable how complicated that is. It's something that can drive dentists crazy because if you have a pulpal problem, because it's so diffuse and there's vitality testing on how to do that on the tooth and on the pulp. And sometimes, I saw a radiograph one time that a root canal was done here, 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 here. A root canal was done all along this side of the mandible. Turned out the person had so they're very, very difficult to work out. Very difficult to work out. Wish I had time to tell you about a, a recording, but in general, with uh, who thought he had throat cancer, turned out he had a bad tooth. Okay, we have built into us endogenous pain suppression systems. Our body makes its own opioids, forms of it. And during periods of stress, Acute stress and acute trauma, oftentimes the body will activate this system and for a short period of time, a person really isn't suffering a whole lot of discomfort and pain, but it doesn't last very long. So oftentimes during periods of stress or trauma, you can activate this process and you relief primarily endorphins, but also in cathodons, and these are opioid-like molecules. They bind opioid receptors. So here we're looking at, so let's say we're looking at brain from the side. Here's the brain stem. And right here is the uh, base of the third ventricle, right here. And right here is what's called the periaqueductal gray matter. So this is what's blown up right here. And you happen to have opioids right there opioid receptor, excuse me. So your hypothalamus, your hypothalamus during periods of trauma and stress can release some beta endorphins, for example, bind new opioid receptors here, and you turn on this descending pain suppression pathway all the way down here coming into the spinal cord, and when this releases its uh, neurotransmitter, it causes that presynaptic inhibition we talked about. Here we have inner neurons, and this releasing its neurotransmitter will open chloride channels on the um, synaptic terminals of this inner neuron, and sometimes in this afferent neuron as well. It just depends on which level we are. And the bottom line is when you you open chloride channels, you hyperpolarize the membrane right there, it's hard to release neurotransmitter. It's hard to release neurotransmitter. And therefore, the pain message that would normally be going up to the brain isn't nearly as strong because you are inhibiting. Yep, the pain receptors are firing, this afferent neuron is firing this tremendously, but here in the middle, here in the level of spinal cord, you have this presynaptic inhibition and it decreases blood transmission leaves the spinal cord and goes up the brain. So there is usually this whole period of time after somebody suffers severe trauma when they may be coherent and they may not be in tremendous pain. And chances are this is operating. Does it operate very long? No, it really doesn't matter of minutes to hours. Now, a lot of people say that, uh, some people, years ago, you used to hear people about 
talked about uh, runner's high. And there has been some studies showing that some people, when you get out, you know, maybe 15, 20 minutes, all of the minutes, 15 to 20 miles, all of a sudden they kind of feel a little bit euphoric. And they take taken blood samples, and yeah, they, they find endorphins in their system, and uh, not just, they're actually, they can actually be used to the bloodstream as well. But um, people have reported those feelings, and you can't isolate endorphins. But I'll tell you what, I trained all the way out to a full marathon, and I never got high once. <laughs> and, uh, and even when I ran the marathon, I sure as heck wasn't high that. <laughs> and I'll have to tell you the story about if you have the flu a week and a half before, along with 160 medical students, we all got influenza together, we probably should back down and do the half rather than the full, because uh, <laughs> it's kind of interesting how, oh, I'm ready to go, and then you get cramps from your earlobes down to your big toe. Anyway, so let's say you have some type of painful stimulation, that pain can, that acute pain can activate this T setting pain suppression pathway and intercept that message and block some of it. Does it block all of it? No. But it does block some of it, at least temporarily. Now, you will be utilizing this T setting pain suppression pathway a lot over, over the next few years with your patients because when you give opioid-like drugs, you're basically hijacking this machinery. So this is all coming down to bind mu opioid receptors here. There's mu opioid receptors on actually the presynaptic terminals of this aperit neuron. There's uh, opioid receptors here. There's a presynaptic inhibition uh, going on. So you will actually, when you prescribe opioid drugs, you are activating and utilizing the targets of this descending pain suppression pathway. And oftentimes people can have severe pain in one place, but when you give opioids, it's inhibiting this all along the brain stem and the spinal cord. It doesn't matter where. You have these descending pain suppression pathways coming down to all the spinal levels. So it's really a shotgun approach to try to reduce localized pain in one area. So prescribing opioids utilizes this machinery. And you can keep pain suppression going on for a lot, lot longer with synthetic opioid drugs that, that given over a period of time. This is the way your book shows this. It's definitely worth looking at it. Here's the a setting pain suppression pathway. They put a little bit more into it than why, what I did. They uh, are showing that right here, uh, this is causing the presynaptic inhibition, and there's also direct inhibition of the A setting pathway. But it happens to be a pretty elaborate network, bottom line, it, it, does, it does work. And when you prescribe opioid drugs, they're utilizing this existing machinery to activate these descending pain suppression pathways. And actually, when you look at the mechanism of action for opioid drugs, it says activation of descending pain suppression neurons. Okay, so, yes? So how does somebody become addicted? Like, if they are prescribed an opioid and it's actually targeting and it's blocking the pain that it should, how do they become addicted to it? If it's actually Wholly different mechanism. Wholly different mechanism. Wholly different mechanism. And that, you know, this is from earlier this year. That's going on big time right now. Big time. Because there have been this push in the last 12, 15 years to get patients out of pain. And unfortunately, some people like the way opioids make them feel. I hate the way they make me feel. Uh, so, you know, it's hard for me to understand how you get addicted to that because when I got banged up, you know, I was, well, you really do need to take these, and it's like, I can't do my job, can't live my life taking these things. I hate the way they feel. Some people don't. Some people don't. So there's a lot of 
drug-seeking behaviors, trying to get opioids from multiple healthcare practitioners to uh, for this, and so there's a big problem right now. So this spring, there is new federal guidelines on trying to track uh, prescription opioid medications and um, prescribing uh, guidelines. So big problem now. You know, it's becoming harder for people who want to abuse the prescription drugs to get them, so what are they turning to? Heroin. But heroin activates those mu opioid. There's both mu and kappa opioid receptors, and, and so I'm just talking about the mu. But uh, there's another receptor too, which I'm not going to really talk about. But people that no longer can get prescription drugs, it turns out heroin in many, many, many places is very easy to get, and there are specific areas and states where the life expectancy of people in the last few years has changed dramatically due to heroin overdose because of this. Okay, uh, voltage gauge sodium channels, you know they are needed to have depolarization. It turns out it's just, there, there's many voltage gated sodium channels. There's something like 60 of them, and I just make it sound like there's one. Well, there's one specific one that really is a, important in pain transmission. And you see, uh, there's a site here, and well, there's another one coming up. But here is the, it's hard to envision this, but this would be the voltage-gated sodium channel. And here, right in this spot, if where you normally have a leucine, if you if it's mutated, you have a histidine there, this causes a gain of function of that receptor. Bottom line, if you get that from biological mom and dad, or if there's a spontaneous mutation, what this means is it's very easy for you to suffer pain. This sodium channel is easily, easily activated. Whereas if you happen to have trying to figure out there's a there's another mutation here that if you have a and instead you have a spartate uh, there, that causes you to be immune to pain. So not, not a surprise. And look at this, and that was just the first papers. All of these, this is the, the protein that makes up the uh, voltage-gated sodium channels. And each one, each one of these dots is a mutation that has been identified. And the red ones are gain of function. These are, no, excuse me, the red ones are loss of function. If you have these, you don't sense pain the way people often do. If you have these, you sense more pain. So pain is very complicated. Very, very complicated. And with that, we switch to the new packet of notes on um, muscle. Not muscle, but motor alpha. So I've already talked about this. The sensory nervous system and the motor nervous system work together very, very closely. One without the other wouldn't do us very much good. So what we're now going to do is we're going to look at what's built into different levels of our nervous system. What motor processes do we get? So we'll look at what motor functions come from the cerebral cortex and the descending spinal tracts. What motor functions are built into the brainstem, the cerebellum, and basal nuclei? What motor functions are built into the spinal cord? Turns out many motor functions. So, up here in the cerebral cortex, the cerebral cortex, I'm sure you know, this is what gives us most of our conscious voluntary movement. Most of our conscious voluntary movements involve cortical function. But, much of the synaptic circuitry for many of the movements of the periphery of our body, our arms and legs, they're not actually directly controlled by the cerebral cortex. It's actually circuits in your spinal cord that's actually producing most of the movements. What does the cerebral cortex do? It sends a go signal. It says, okay, activate this movement pattern. And they're called movement pattern generators. So your cerebral cortex says, okay, activate this movement pattern generator for moving your arms. 
and your cerebral cortex says, move faster. And your cerebral cortex can say, do it with more force. So your cerebral cortex will initiate and give instructions, but much of the synaptic circuitry for specific movements actually in lower neurological centers. There's one very important exception. That exception is fine movements of the fingers, hands, and wrists. Fine movements of the fingers, hands, and wrists is controlled directly by an area of your primary motive, motive cortex of your brain. You're going to see that. So there's a couple of different figures in the book, 10 2 and 10 10, that you have a lot of motor areas. Now, we already looked at this ridge right behind the central sulcus. That's called your somatic sensory cortex, or just called your sensory cortex. But there's a ridge, or the term for ridge is a gyrus. There's a free central gyrus. The free central gyrus is your primary motor cortex. And we're going to see that there's specific areas that have to do with your legs, uh, specific areas for your arms, your fingers, your hands, uh, for your face. Along with that, there are a number of what are called associated muscle areas. Do you need to memorize these things? Absolutely not. But there are these specific areas that, for example, for eye tracking, that if you happen to have an injury here, you lose some of your motor ability to track objects, uh, along with right here. Hand rotation, uh, hand skills. If you damage this area, some of your hand skills uh, go away. And I've already talked about wood work formation and wood choice areas. They're considered motor areas. For, uh, and you have damage there, you have aphasia. aphasia. So yes, we have this primary motor cortex, but we also have another set of dedicated motor areas in our cerebral cortex. And they all help, they all participate in regulating their motor output. So this is similar to what's in this edition of the book. So right here is the, here they're just calling it the sensory motor cortex, but here's the central sulcus. So right here would be the somatosensory cortex. Right here would be the primary motor cortex right there. We'll talk about the brainstem, cerebellum, and the basal nuclei coming up here. So if you look at that primary motor cortex right there, it's laid out geographically, just like you saw, very similar for your somatosensory cortex. If you, I, I should have looked to see if this was done. If you stimulate different areas on here, you will, if you sedate a patient, and this is done all the time during certain types of surgeries, and you electrically stimulate this area, you might get this finger okay? And so on and so forth. You can see a huge amount of space dedicated to the oral cavity. Thought that speech is very important. Important selection advantage for our ancestors, and the ones that have better speech, survive better, and the area of your hands and fingers takes up about a quarter of the space. So fine movements of hands, fingers, and wrists, very important for the survival of our ancestors in more hostile environments. And this is the way the, um, the book lays it out. And how many of you have seen the, it's a, you know, kayak is one of these uh, reservation uh, sites where you can book flights and hotel rooms and so forth. How many of you remember seeing it was around Christmas time last year about, well, let's just see if, I'm, I'm just afraid it's going to come up with a, a YouTube commercial and then we're just going to have to ask it. But it's funny. Okay, let's see what we got here. This is completely unethical. My hours are unethical. I don't have time to sit around searching cones of travel sites looking for flights and hotels. Just use Kaya. It compares height to travel sites in seconds. Well, I guess you're the brains of this operation. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what he's doing. He's, he's activating the primary motor cortex, 
So the guy can, the surgeon can web search while he's doing the surgery. And you know, and actually, can you do that? No, but you can stimulate different areas and they will see which areas move or they'll actually put EMGs to see where the muscles are being activated. Okay. So now let's go a little bit farther down. Let's look at descending nerve tracts that start up in the brain and the brain stem and now they're going to go down the spinal cord, descending brain tract. And there's many, many of them. But I'm only going to talk about two general tracts. The cortical spinal tract, sometimes called the pyramidal or, pyramidal or parietal. It depends on if you're trained by people from Great Britain. Or the brainstem tracts, or they're called the extra parietal or extra pyramidal tracts. So, you know, we have all these slides here. So the cortical spinal tract is really composed of two different ones, the anterior cortical spinal tract. And these names tell you where they start. It starts up in your cerebral cortex. Where does it go? It runs in your spinal cord. So there's an anterior right here, cortical spinal tract, and there is a lateral cortical spinal tract. Have you got to this in gross yet? Nope, okay, that's fine. And then the brainstem tracts they actually originate in areas of brain stem. Here's the rubrospinal tract, the reticulospinal tract, and the vestibulospinal tract. This originates, and rubro means red. There's an area in your brain stem called the red nucleus. That's where it starts, and then it runs down. It descends down the spinal cord. The reticular formation, which you've heard of, that's where the reticulo uh, spinal tract originates, and then the, this, you have what's called the vestibular apparatus, that's where the vestibular spinal tract originates, and it descends down the spinal cord. And just a little review over here, remember sensory information comes in via dorsal nerve roots, motor neurons go out anterior, or the other term is ventral nerve roots. So, first one we're going to look at is this cortical spinal or pyramidal tract. This is really important for control of your hands, fingers, and your wrists. This gives us very precise control, great dexterity. The reason that you can write with a pen is because of this trap. This runs from the motor cortex downward through the brain stem, and some of the fibers are going to, once we're in the medulla, they're going to cross over to the contralateral side of the body. But some don't cross, they remain on the ipsilateral side and they go down the anterior. So the ones that cross then go down the contralateral, uh, lateral cortical spinal tract. The ones that remain, that don't cross, they go down the ipsilateral contralateral spinal tract. We're going to see that they're going to interact with motor neurons, that peripheral motor neurons that go out to innervate the muscles of the fingers, hands, and wrists. And this track is a spine conscious movement, especially for the fingers and the hands. And generally, once again, the right brain controls the left side. So here, once again, is the lateral cortical spinal tract. Here's the anterior cortical spinal tract. And here's kind of what the big picture looks like. So up here in your primary motor cortex, that's where this originates. So here we have neurons running down through the brain. Now it's coming down through the brain stem. Your mesencephalon, your pons, and your medulla make up your brain stem. So they're penetrating down the brain stem. This started on the right side of the brain, so they're still on the ipsilateral side. But here at the pyramids, the, this area of desiccation in your medulla, about 80% of those fibers cross over and then descend down the lateral cortical spinal tract. And about 20% of them, they continue down the ipsilateral side, down the anterior cortical spinal tract. But in both cases, so the, the ones that uh, crossed over to the opposite side of the body, that happened here at the medulla, they're going down the lateral. The ones that went down the anterior, they cross over to the contralateral side of the body as well, but they just do it at the level here at the spinal cord. What do they do? They innervate motor neurons. 
that function and control your uh, fingers, your hands, and your wrists. So here we have anterior motor neurons. And it's not just A alpha motor neurons, it's also A gamma motor neurons, which you'll see a little bit more about later. So you have the idea of moving your index, your right index finger, and it's going to activate a specific pathway that, whoops, it start here on the left primary motor cortex, it go down some cross, some don't, and then it's going to activate your right index finger. So, check this out. This is a long neuron that comes down and very specifically controls the neurons that control your hands, your fingers, and your wrists. So this is very fine, discrete control. Most of the pathways we'll see are not this controlling. Uh, it'll activate an area. But this is very discrete control. Yes? So the anterior doesn't cross over until it gets on the spinal cord, but the lateral crosses over in the pyramids? And the medulla. And the medulla. And you'll see in gross, in the back of the medulla, you'll see something that looks like this. You see all this cross hatching. And that's some neurons going this way, some neurons going that way. It's in uh, it's called pyramids. And so now let's kind of switch to the brainstem tracks. The brainstem. Yeah, yeah. Um, how in depth do you want us to know the different um, uh, pathways in the in the spinal cord, like the an anterior nerve root, the anterior corticospinal tract? You've got to know. Okay. Yeah, you've got to know this. There's specific uh, disease processes when you get to clinical pathophys. If you know them now, yeah, are you going to partially forget them? But you're going to recover them more quickly when you get to clinical uh, pathophys. Yeah. So let's look at the brainstem tracts. Once again, these originate in the, in the brainstem. And now this, okay, this is, now ask me the question. How well do we need to know this? No. Not to this extent. <laughs> okay. This, this kind of tells you about all of the input it takes to control motor uh, function. Now, there's something I do want you to notice. Here's your primary motor cortex, and this line clear out here, this is your cortical spinal tracts. They come down and very directly control those lower motor neurons. But these brainstem tracts, they get information from the cerebral cortex, but they filter it through basal nuclei, the red nucleus, the cerebellum, to finally activate these tracts. So there's a whole lot of processing. So this is what I mean, the cerebral cortex is not controlled directly a lot of movements of the body other than the fingers and hands. So here, is the reticular formation of your brain. That, this is in your ponza medulla. And it receives all sorts of information from your cerebral cortex and the basal nuclei. And it can activate neurons that will then come down and activate these anterior motor neurons that go out to muscles. Over here is the area in your brain set called the red nucleus. So here's another track that will come down and control those anterior motor neurons. And here, in your vestibular nucleus, that's so important for equilibrium and balance, here's a track that originates there and runs down and activates lower motor neurons. So these brainstem neural tracks, and there's only three of them I'm going to talk about, these are really important for unconscious motor control, things like posture, balance, walking. And they also participate in voluntary movement as well. But, you know, anytime you're voluntarily moving, you need to readjust your equilibrium and balance and posture. These are doing it in real time. But do you need to memorize this whole pathway up here? No, not for me anyway, not for me. So. This is the way your book digests it. It shows, okay, here's a cortical spinal tract, 
and it doesn't really show anterior lateral, uh, but it is controlling contralateral motor neurons, primary motor neurons. Now, brain <coughs> contracts, they're interesting, but most, most of them don't uh, cross. They remain on the, if you activate a brain stem track on the right side of the body, it's going to go to a right side muscle. So that's one of the violations of, you know, right side controls the left side, that kind of thing. Brain stem tracks, most of them, not all, but most are uncrossed. Okay, so what else is built to the brain stem and basal nuclei and cerebellum? Well, in the polytomedula, you have huge, huge numbers of reflex centers. You have reflex centers for respiratory control. I, those of you who have, you've all had physiology, but you know that your SA node is really the pacemaker of the heart. Well, you have a pacemaker associated for ventilation in your brainstem, the brainstem. And you have, excuse me, heart rate and blood pressure control centers and sympathetic and parasympathetic uh, regulatory centers in your brainstem. You have GI function reflex actions. You have equilibrium. Well, that's where you have your vestibular apparatus. You have eye movement reflex centers. Remember, reflexes are an unconscious thing that's built into the system. And, you know, you hear about these Zika virus babies that have just huge cerebral atrophy. Well, there are cases of, I don't know how bad it is with uh, uh, Zika, but there are certain cerebral atrophy syndromes in some children where they basically have no cerebral cortex whatsoever. So it's like not what we would perceive as conscious function or conscious perception, but this must just be devastating to the parents because those babies, their eyes will track Eye tract and reflexes are built to the brainstem. That persists in those, those children. So, you know, the parents say, well, I, I know my baby knows I'm here because her eyes will follow me a little bit if I'm close enough. If I'm close enough, the eyes will follow. Well, we have reflex eye movement. If something's moving across your visual field, we reflexively will follow it. There's many different stereotypic body movements that are built in here like uh, the rooting reflex of a newborn. You touch the side of a newborn's face, they open their mouth, and they turn toward it. It's a suckle response. Uh, so there's several stereotypic body movements. Salivation, retching, postural reflexes. So many things are in the brainstem, so that's why brainstem injuries are so devastating. So these are part of the automatic processes of life that help us get through every moment of every day without us even consciously thinking about it. It's built into the system. Okay, so let's go a little bit farther down. We're gonna talk about the basal nuclei and the cerebellum. And I'll see how far I can get here now. Neither the cerebellum or the basal nuclei initiate motor movements. What they do is they modulate motor output. They modulate motor output. They make it more coordinated. They make it more coordinated. So they always function with other motor areas, usually several at a time, and that very scary diagram that I just showed you there with the brainstem tracks, you'll see that the basal nuclei and the cerebellum, uh, they're in there. And so they're helping to, to make more coordinated motor movements. Now I'm not gonna really get too much into this, but both the cerebellum and the basal nuclei give us timing and coordination. And when you have a cerebellar injury or an injury, and it turns out basal nuclei, there's a whole number of them. If you have damage to specific ones in there, your movements become incoordinate. Incoordinate means uncoordinated or discoordinate. That means uncoordinated. What's really, what is coordination really? What's movement coordination? It's turning on a movement and turning it off at the right time. And it's wrist movements, elbow movements, shoulder movements, moving, turning on, turning off in a 
very coordinated fashion. And just think about it, just walking, what's happening at the hips, at the knees, at the ankles, what's turning on and what's turning off, right time, turning on at the right time, turning off at the right time, going between extensors and flexors, it's incredibly complicated. These areas help the, for the, the timing for that, with your arms, with your legs, and other movements of the body. So damage to those areas very, very can be very devastating. Uh, for example, the cerebellum, the thing that I always think about it, it receives information from the sensory nervous system. It receives information from the primary motor cortex. And what does the cerebellum, what is it really doing? It's comparing the movement you want to make to what your joint's actually doing. So it's comparing your intended movement to the actual movement and it's making adjustments in real time, in nanoseconds and milliseconds, to try to make what you want to do closer to what your body's actually doing. That's pretty cool. So it's this autocorrect, autocorrect, autocorrect. For example, if uh, I want to point at that projector and if I have a cerebellar injury, you know, right now I'm just pointing to the projector by somebody with a certain cerebellar injury, they'll have something called overshoot. They'll try to get there, and then they try to correct, try to correct, try to correct, try to correct. So it looks like this. That's called an intention tremor. They're intending to make that, and to try to line that up the way they want, you get a tremor at the end. You get a tremor at the end. But we'll get some YouTube videos on that. Now, before you take off, I, you know, I've mentioned to you, I'm hoping, hoping, hoping you're, you're reading cardiovascular. Please, for next time, would you read this on muscle? Please write these down. 9.1, section 9.1, 9.2, table 9.2, section 9.7, 9.8, 9.9, 9.10, and table 9.6. We're going to go through skeletal, smooth, and cardiac muscle contrast and compare. What, or how are they similar? How are they different? And uh, please read that because I do go through that material pretty quickly because most people at least have had a pretty good understanding of skeletal muscle contraction. So, I will see you next week. Have a good weekend.